Hello, film fans. Picture this. You're on your honeymoon in beautiful, sunny Miami Beach. You're with the one you love. Finally, all prepared for some sexy, fun time in the sun, and boom! You meet someone new and fall in love. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Well, that's the situation the protagonist of The Heartbreak Kid finds himself in. The film we'll be talking about in this episode of What Makes This Film Great. Tonight's been the best night of our whole trip, hasn't it? Aren't you happy tonight? See, that's, that's part of what I wanted to talk about. The Heartbreak Kid is a 1972 film that was put out by 20th Century Fox. The script was written by Neil Simon, based on a short story called A Change of Plan by Bruce J. Friedman. And the film was directed by Elaine May, her second film as director after A New Leaf. At the time, Neil Simon was a pretty huge deal. He was a Broadway playwright who'd had several smash hits in the 60s, including probably most notably Barefoot in the Park and The Odd Couple, both of which had also been turned into hugely successful films. Elaine May, also a bit of a big deal at the time, she got her start, as probably a lot of you know, as part of the comedy duo with Mike Nichols, Nichols and May, and they'd had huge success in the late 50s and early 60s, taking their two-person show on the road around the United States and selling out auditoriums. They'd also recorded their shows for what would become best-selling and Grammy-winning records. The duo split up at the height of their success, and Nichols went on to have a successful multi-decade theater and film directing career, including taking part in launching the new Hollywood era with the 1967 film, The Graduate. May came to directing a little bit later than Nichols, and by the time she came around to The Heartbreak Kid, she had one film, A New Leaf, under her belt, but she was not nearly as popular or successful as Simon, and didn't have nearly the reputational capital that he did to bring to this film. This is why we get this interesting title card, where first we see Neil Simon's name, followed by Elaine May's name. And that's quite strange to see two possessory credits for the same film. You might have seen that back in the studio era with a producer or a studio head and the director, but it was rare to see this, and it's still rare to see this today with a writer getting a possessory credit and getting that credit above the title before the director. That just demonstrates a bit Simon's role and Simon's power that he brought into making this film. He insisted that the script be followed to the letter something that he later complained Elaine May didn't do. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we talk about what works about this film and what makes this film great. The Heartbreak Kid stars Charles Grodin as Lenny in one of Grodin's first starring performances. Lenny is in love, maybe, with Lila, played by Jeannie Berlin, Elaine May's daughter. He's certainly in lust with Lila, the relationship is established very quickly as somewhat physical, but Lila wants to wait until marriage, and so they get married. Immediately after the wedding, they embark on a two-day road trip to Miami Beach for their honeymoon. And already on that trip, Lenny's starting to have doubts about the marriage, even as his desire to have sex with Lila is finally fulfilled. Once they get to Miami Beach, Lenny meets Kelly, played by Sybil Shepherd in her second film, After the Last Picture Show. Kelly is a young 20s college student on Christmas break with her parents from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And she starts flirting with Lenny almost immediately upon meeting him. He's quickly smitten and then falls in love. This is compounded by the fact that Lila lies in the sun for too long on the first day and gets an incredibly horrible, monstrous sunburn all over her body. And so is bedridden for the first couple of days of the honeymoon, which allows Lenny to sneak out under the auspices of all kinds of crazy excuses and meet with Kelly. Lenny becomes convinced that he's in love with Kelly, that he made a mistake marrying Lila, that he's going to leave Lila and pursue Kelly, even if it means following her and her family back to Minnesota. Kelly's father, played incredibly by Eddie Alpert, is completely against this idea. He thinks Lenny's a schmuck. He wants him to have nothing to do with his daughter. It's not a question of my not approving of you. It's a question of... I don't like one goddamn thing about you. But as the film unfolds, Lenny is relentless in his pursuit of Kelly. 
And this is the world in which the film takes place. And as you can see, it's ripe for comic situations. Neil Simon was a comic playwright. He specialized in writing about characters who would butt heads, who were often at odds, and who had to spend the length of the play somehow learning to live together, or to manage to at least feel comfortable in each other's company. You see that in The Odd Couple, or you see it in something like the late 70s, The Goodbye Girl. And it could have been that kind of film. Lots of situational comedy, lots of silly jokes, and they're there. They're in the script, and the actors act the script. But what makes The Heartbreak Kid really work is Elaine May's direction, and how she pushes Simon's script through her directing choices, both in cinematography and in editing, to peel away the sort of simple situational comedy of Simon's script and get to something a little more uncomfortable or disturbing underneath. The film's cinematographer is Owen Roisman. Some of you might know him for his work with William Friedkin on The Exorcist. He also shot Sidney Lumet's Network and a bunch of other films in the 70s and 80s. There are a few flourishes of cinematography in the film. For example, this scene that's shot in a blue light. I just said it. How many times you want me to say it? If you wouldn't keep asking me so much, you would have heard me say it. It's goddamn wonderful, all right? I'm sorry. That's a scene where Lenny, still on the road trip down to Miami Beach, is already starting to feel uncomfortable about this relationship with Lila. The sex isn't what he was hoping it would be, and Lila's turning out to be a more colorful person than he had imagined when he only had one thing on his mind, and actually visually foreshadows the end of the film. Another great short flourish of the cinematography is this tilting camera shot of this hotel as they pull into Miami Beach. Again, a little bit of foreshadowing. It makes the building look great, but it also indicates the way this whole trip is about to be topsy-turvy. It's going to upturn Lenny's life in surprising and hopefully good ways, but it's going to devastate Lila in the way it just spins her upside down. Another great small moment of cinematography in the film is Kelly's first appearance. Lila's still up in the hotel room. This is before she's got the sunburn, and Lenny's tired of waiting for her. So he goes down to the beach to catch some rays before she comes down. And then Kelly appears. That's my spot. What? Excuse me? I said you're lying in my spot. This is your spot? Everybody knows that. I didn't know. I'm just, I just got here. Uh -huh. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I move. I, I just got here. Never mind. Just don't do it again. The way she's shot here is really significant. With that halo of the sun around her, it gives her an almost angelic presence. And this is intentional to contrast her with the shots we've seen of Lila on the trip all the way down from New York to Miami Beach, where she's got, for example, egg salad all over her face. Or where she gets up out of bed and tells Lenny, Where are you going? Pee-pee. For some reason, pee-pee becomes a thing that Lenny can't deal with. But returning to the relationship between the script and the cinematography, where the film really comes alive is in two choices that May makes with Roisman about how to shoot particular scenes. One of the things they do throughout the film is to hold shots in long takes, sometimes uncomfortably so. So we get shots of Lenny just looking off into the distance. These shots almost have a kind of Kuleshov effect where we can read as audience members into Lenny anything that we think he might be experiencing. So after he's just had sex for the first time and he stares off into space like this, some of us might read that as satisfied. Some of us might read it as dissatisfied, regretful, or something else indicating his decision to come to leave Lila. Then there are other long takes that are dialogue shots where we get a two shot 
and the camera doesn't move or maybe it just moves slightly but there's no shot reverse shot to break up the tension of the conversation and these long takes often occur during awkward conversations oh, you mean uh... You sell balls and bats, huh? That's what you mean, balls no. and bats? Last year in this country, sir, over two billion dollars was spent on recreation. Is that right? On balls and bats. The other decision May makes is to switch between a locked down camera that doesn't move and handheld cameras. When we switch from a steady shot, from a calm locked shot, to a handheld shot, we get these moments of uncertainty of discombobulation. The handheld is not wild, it's not like a born identity fight scene or something like that, but it gives a sense of uncertainty, as in this scene when Lenny is once again trying to convince Lila that it's okay for him to go out without her on their honeymoon. In Florida? Oh honey, it, it's, not, it's not the amount of time that you spend with somebody, it's, it's how the time was spent and I I feel it. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget these three days. Where are you going now? Honey, 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 I've got to, I've got to visit Wilmer's family. Wilmer keeled over signing an affidavit. The result of this camera work is to, as I said earlier, push at the fabric of the narrative. We have a screenplay that's full of jokes, full of one-liners, and we have performers like Grodin and Shepard in Berlin who play these parts wonderfully. But when they're directed to stay still while the camera moves or doesn't move around them, while we have these moments of silence while the camera just sits on a character, or while we have these cramped frames where awkward conversations are happening, that recasts the jokes. And they're funny, but they're funny almost in that way of cringe humor, where we're just like, we want to be out of this situation. And I think what that does is it has the effect of casting Lenny's decisions and making Lenny's choices creepier, which I'll talk about a bit more in a few minutes. I also have to say a word about the film's editor, John Carter, who does a fantastic job on the film. Carter was an African-American film editor. He was the first black member of the American Cinema Editors Society. He worked on a lot of new Hollywood films in the 70s, including this film with Elaine May. He also edited her, Mikey and Nikki, and Joan Macklin Silver's Between the Lines. By the 80s and 90s, he had a well-established career and started lending his talents to the new wave of African-American filmmakers who were starting to make their way in Hollywood, like Robert Townsend on The Five Heartbeats or F. Gary Gray on Friday. Carter's work in this film is fantastic. First of all, he works with May to establish incredibly quickly moments of change in the film, moments of travel in the film, so that we can get from one place to another, one new narrative beat to the next, and then we can slow time down a little bit to allow for these awkward comedic moments that I was talking about earlier. An example of Carter's work right off the bat is the opening of the film. I'd like to show you the first two and a half minutes just so you can see the economy of how well the story is told through editing. And the scene I'm going to show you is actually the beginning of the film. Strangely enough, there was no 20th Century Fox title card or anything like that. We just start smack into the film. Hi. 
time. Can't you wait ten more days? Can't you? Well, nobody, nobody waits anymore. Nobody does. I'm waiting. Now you can see, after those two and a half minutes, we see Lenny on the prowl, looking to go out, meeting Lila, falling for Lila, trying to get sex with Lila, convincing Lila to marry him, or she convincing him to marry her, and the marriage happening. Boom. That's a really great example of efficient editing. Another thing Carter does throughout the film is an interesting use of sound bridges by using J cuts and L cuts. Those are just examples of when the sound from one scene continues into the next scene, or vice versa, when sound from the next scene starts early, before the image has changed. Cutter and May include these kind of edits, some of them are quite long, so that the two scenes can comment on each other a little bit more. So for example, we get this shot where the wedding has ended, and Lenny and Lila are off on their honeymoon, leaving New York, but the sound of the wedding continues, as if to say, this, this baggage that Lenny has signed up for, or is that he will come to see he's signed up for, is going with him. Another shorter example comes after Lenny meets Kelly in the bar. Lila's in bed sunburned. Lenny's depressed about the way this honeymoon's turning out. He goes down to the bar and Kelly does the same joke to him again that she did on meeting, only instead of saying, you're in my spot, she says, you're in my stool. They flirt, and then he goes back to the room, and there's this short little bridge here. Yeah, I don't even have breakfast. I just have some shoes. I put on my trunks, and I'm down there. Just make sure you stay off my spot. Thanks for the nut. Did you meet anyone at the bar? Again, we get this comment on the previous scene, actually right before the next scene happens. And the film is littered with these moments. And this is again an example of how the film pushes the script, pushes the narrative in cinematic ways that reveal unwritten tensions and unwritten awkwardness. There's a lot more going on in the film as well. This is a great depiction of Jewish life in America, or at least Manhattan Jewish life, and the contrast of New York City Jewishness in Midwestern Protestantism is part of the humor that May finds in the film. There's also an undercurrent of anti-Semitism in the film that doesn't come out very blatantly, but you get scenes like Kelly telling Lenny that they're leaving that hotel because her father doesn't like the clientele. Kelly's father's resistance to Lenny, while he never says anything about Lenny's Jewishness, is a resistance to the East Coast is a resistance to New York, is a resistance to Lenny being in a new kind of business. These things are not necessarily coded as anti-Semitic the way they're deployed in the film, but it's easy to read them there. What I'd like to talk about though is Lenny. Lenny is a schmuck. Lenny is a bad guy. And part of what makes the Heartbreak Kid interesting is that it chooses this bad guy as its protagonist. In the short story, Lenny comes across as somewhat indecisive, 
He's also not as driven by sex. The story implies that Lenny and Lila, who's unnamed in the story, have already had sex before marriage. In the film though, partly because we know he's only married for sex, partly because he, gets, he starts to get irritated with Lila so quickly, and partly because of his dogged pursuit of Kelly, even when he gets to Minneapolis and she's trying to give him the brush off at first, he's relentless in his stalking almost of her, and even engages in what we might call today a bit of gaslighting when Kelly informs him, I didn't expect this. I thought this was just a fling. And he blames her for everything that's going on. You don't even say hello to me. Where's your, where's your, your goddamn laugh? I haven't heard your goddamn laugh uh, one time since I've been here. I can't help it. Florida seems like such a long time ago. It's two weeks ago. What, you can't retain a memory for two weeks? I gave up $6,000. I gave up, I gave up my wife, I gave up my car, and you can't retain a memory for two, what are you, are you re When the film was released, a lot of critics admired Lenny. They thought he was, you know, grabbing life by the seat of the pants and making decisions for himself so that he could be happy. And readings like that continue. Richard Brody wrote an appreciation of the film just a few years ago in The New Yorker where he talks about at the end, Lenny is the winner of the film and Lenny's example is one of um, inspiration. I find Lenny to be tremendously problematic. What's really interesting is that 70s cinema is filled with difficult men, from Popeye Doyle to Travis Bickle. Oftentimes the films can't decide if we're supposed to admire them a little bit. We know Travis Bickle's a psychopath, but his image still adorns university walls the countrywide. Right? People admire him. I think what Maid achieves here is something interesting, is that she shows us a Lenny that is funny, as he is in the script, that is pursuing his dreams or his, his best life, but that does so in such a despicable way that we can't admire him, or I don't think we should admire him. And some of the humor of the end of the film, when Lenny seems to have got what he wanted, and to still be unhappy, comes from our knowledge as viewers that maybe he didn't get what he deserves, because that's to put a lot of pressure on Kelly, but that the kind of person that he is is never going to really achieve happiness because he's too selfish, he lacks empathy, and he thinks the world only revolves around him. So what you get in the end is a very black comedy. This is a dark film underneath all of its comical lightness. And that's what I think makes it such a good film and so worth watching and so worth re-watching. Because, you know, the first time I watched this film, I also thought Lila was annoying <laughs> because she's played that way. But the more you watch the film, the more you see that Lila is just in love. She's just herself and it's Lenny who's annoying, Lenny, who's disgusting, Lenny, who's despicable. And watching how the film peels those layers back make it a really fascinating cinematic experience. That's all for now. My name is Aaron Hunter. Thanks for watching.